Hello again, everybody. And I hope that move from one virtual space to another was smooth. We're now looking at housing as infrastructure of care. Now, this session is going to be captured by our graphic illustrator, Zara Zainal, who's going to be following the session and illustrating as she goes. Hopefully she can wave and say hello. You will get to see her work as it unfolds. And the work she did yesterday was absolutely fascinating. It just jumped from the page and really reflect, reflected beautifully the discussions that were happening. It was um, really captured uh, uh, what was going on. It was really terrific. So you'll get a chance to see that. Um, I would now like to introduce our moderator for this session, Helene Frischaux, Director of the Bachelor of Design and Professor of Architecture and Philosophy at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Helene. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, right, I've got my mute off. Excellent. Ready to go. I'm very honoured to be hosting this important panel curated and organised by the wonderful Kate Raynor, one of the conveners of this conference, Housing Assemblage, a Housing Assembly. Now, while in lockdown, I've been tuning in late at night to the Netflix miniseries Made, starring Margaret Qualey and Andy McDowell, a real life mother and daughter team playing a mother and daughter. Qualey plays Alex, a young mother escaping a situation of domestic violence of the insidious, emotional and controlling kind. She must navigate an extremely complex bureaucratic paper trail to have her vulnerable position acknowledged and to secure a home for herself and her young child at the same time managing a low paid and undervalued cleaning job. All of this from the midst of the debilitating emotional after effects of trauma, something she can't even quite put a name to at first. The vivid precarity of housing for women and vulnerable minorities looms to the fore, younger and older, just one step away from homelessness. Now this panel this morning is dedicated to housing reconceptualized as an infrastructure of care answering to the needs of the more vulnerable in our communities. Something the panel members share, I would argue, implicitly and ex explicitly, is a focus on care ethics, which for me at least admits a strong feminist and intersectional tradition, and how we give and receive care, and how care can be distinguished from, as well as work alongside justice frameworks, including the idea of housing being a basic human right. We will hear this morning from five extraordinary women speaking from the social sciences and from design research and academia, from government and non-government organisations. We will hear about the lived experience of housing precarity. We will hear about the challenges of fostering a facilitative environment that we can call home. We'll hear a little bit about what works and what doesn't when it comes to the design of safe refugia. So joining me on the panel today, we have Emma Power from Western Sydney University, and she'll be speaking first and offering um, our panel keynote for 30 minutes. We'll also hear from Sina, who's founder and facilitator of Melbourne Homeless Women's Peer Support Group, and she'll be offering a response of around 10 or so minutes. We also have with us today, Claire Stacey, the manager of Homes Victoria as well as Erica Martino, Research Fellow in Healthy Housing at the University of Melbourne, and Nicole Carms of the XYX Lab dedicated to gender in place at Monash University. Claire, Erica and Nicole will be speaking each for around five minutes, positioning their work in relation to Emma's, and um, then we're going to conclude with the discussion. I want to encourage the audience uh, to um, put your questions in uh, the quest, you know, Q&A tab as we go, because there's somewhat of a, la a delay between what we're saying and what you're hearing. So make sure to put your questions in as we proceed. Now, what I'd like to do is introduce our um, first speaker, our keynote for today, Dr. Emma Power, who's Senior Lecturer in the School of Social Sciences, uh, where she's an Institute Fellow in the Institute of Culture and Society at the Western Sydney University. Emma's an urban geographer and housing researcher. Her Cities of Care research program envisions a world of more just and caring cities, developing new insights into the caring potentials of cities and our housing system. This work is motivated by an interest in what makes cities livable and by concerns about the implications of growing urban and housing inequality. I'm a particular fan of her recently published article with Kathleen Mees in housing studies called Housing and Infrastructure of Care. And this is also what Emma will be speaking about today. So welcome, Emma. 
There we go. We've got to come off the mute. That's always the big challenge, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Um, it's a pleasure to join you for the conversation this morning. I'm speaking today from the lands of the Darug and Gundungurra people in the Blue Mountains just west of Sydney. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the elders and this country, which was never ceded. My connections with this country have really sustained me over the last few months while we've been in lockdown, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to think with you today about care from this place, which has been so important in caring with me at this time. So I'd like to start today by sharing a story. This is Sue's story. Sue lives in an outer suburb of Sydney. She's in her 60s and she's lived alone since her husband passed away. Sue is at home in social housing, but before this, she lived with her husband in a number of private rental homes across the Sydney region. Sue left her professional job when her husband developed a chronic illness and she became his carer. At that time, they couldn't afford their private rental anymore. And with his illness, they were able to qualify for public housing. This was a move that secured their future. It guaranteed them shelter and a place to care, but it also came with some costs. The first one of these was financial. So Sue and her husband lost four weeks of bond to cover the landlord's costs, removing adaptations that had been approved during the tenancy to support Sue's husband's health needs. Sue was pretty grateful, though, that the adaptations had been approved at all because tenancy legislation in New South Wales doesn't require that landlords agree to any changes to a property, even to support needs connected with disability and ageing. Sue saw the loss of money as an unfortunate but necessary cost that was connected with living in the private rental sector. But living so close to the poverty line, it was a substantial loss. The second cost that Sue sustained was to family. Now, I met Sue while I was researching the housing experiences of single older women who are not homeowners, a group that we know is one of the most vulnerable in the Australian housing system. In the hours that she spent sharing her story, Sue repeatedly described distress at the breakdown in her relationship with her son, her only living child and her only family in Australia, after he had to move away from the family so that they could qualify for priority public housing. He was a recent school leaver who'd managed to get a job in a local supermarket, but his income, when it was included in household income calculations, as is required by policy, put the family over the allocation threshold. Sue was able to organise some accommodation for him with family friends in a distant suburb and she explained that she now rarely sees him. Sue cried repeatedly during our time together, including when she described her distance from her son. She said, he's not a source of income, he's living at home, he is my child. I don't want anything from him and he's the only support I had here. I just find it so hard. He couldn't live with us and I had to let him go to take care of my husband. Sue believed that she would have been more able to fulfil her caring responsibilities to her husband with her son living at home. She and her husband could have received support from their son and their son could have spent more time with his dad while he was still alive. She could also have better fulfilled what she saw as her mothering role. And so for this woman, public housing eligibility policies contributed to the erosion of family relationships, her mothering identity and care. At the same time, though, their social housing made their care possible. So the income index rent enabled Sue to leave her paid work and take on the role of carer. She was able to care for her husband until he passed away. The state landlord also supported and paid for a renovation that set up one of the rooms so that it was suitable for doing some of the more time-consuming, complex and messy care practices that were required at this time. So the house became, as my colleague Kathy Mee has written elsewhere, a place to care. For Sue, this is a story about care and when she tells it, she emphasises family care and care resilience. It's also a story about the intersections between housing and care. So we can see that Sue's capacity to care for herself, her husband and her child is organised through the housing and welfare systems that she's part of. Her housing tenure, her weekly rent, the built form of the houses that she's lived in, give shape to her story and the ways that she's able to care. And just like in Sue's story, for all of us, the homes that we live in, the housing system that our homes are part of, shape our capacity to give and receive care 
and they bring texture to the ways that we care within and beyond our households. Housing also shapes access to care at a social scale. So our housing system is deeply implicated in where we live and how much money is left over after we meet our housing costs. Our tenure often defines how we can live in our homes. And through this, housing shapes an unequal social geography of care. By putting care at the centre of how we talk about housing, what we do is we bring these questions of care and equality to the front and centre of how we understand housing. And it's the starting point for advocating for care-based reform and transformation of our housing system. And it's a really, really important moment to be having these sorts of conversations. We have a growing housing crisis. We live in a time when both care and housing are being reworked through neoliberal market logics. These logics are seeing both care and housing positioned in public debate and in public policy as commodities and as individual responsibilities. We are held to be responsible for independently meeting our own needs for housing and care through the market. And people who are not able to meet these needs are seen as being responsible for that failure, as though they haven't worked hard enough or haven't tried hard enough. To critically examine the connections between housing and care and to reconceptualise housing through an ethic of care is to change that public conversation. It's a way to call out the barriers that exist in our housing system and that unequally impact the ability of some people, growing numbers of people, to meet their basic needs. This is a political move. It's a call to make visible neglected activities that we want to see made more valued. It's to deny that care is a private practice and that we meet our needs on our own. And it's instead to begin to point out the many, many ways that our housing system organises how we care and who can care. And to point out how our housing system unequally shapes the ability of different people and groups to meet their essential needs. And so housing is a care infrastructure. And I wanna spend our time this morning unpacking what this means and what implications it has for how we understand housing. I'm gonna start by thinking about what an infrastructural analysis can offer to thinking on housing. And then I'm gonna move on to set out briefly what I mean by care. And after that, we're gonna to turn to three of the main ways that housing infrastructurally organizes care. Towards the end, I'll reflect, reflect briefly on care as a central ethic for rethinking and reorganizing our housing systems. Before we get started though, I just wanna briefly, um, but also deeply acknowledge the team of people who I work with um, on projects that for me are part of my Cities of Care research program. And these include, of course, um, Kathy Mee from the University of Newcastle, whom as Ellen pointed out, I wrote the paper, Housing a Care Infrastructure, <coughs> from which this talk builds. I also wanna acknowledge colleagues in the Shadow Care Infrastructures and valuing cooperative housing ARCs, as well as Miriam Williams, Charles, Charles Gillen, sorry, and Tegan Bergen, with whom I write about cities, housing, and care. So what does it mean to think infrastructurally about housing and care? Most often we think about our housing simply as the location or, or the place within which care takes place. It's appeared almost as a neutral container or background for care work. To some extent, this has been a product of academic frames. So there's been a separation between housing and home in much research. Care hasn't really featured in housing research. And there's been only a fairly limited unpacking of care, of housing, sorry, in work on care. But this invisibility of care is also a product of dominant political thinking. So the idea that we are all equal in the face of the market and that we use the market to buy or rent the housing that best suits our needs has been really powerful. It's an idea that has removed the need for any sort of public conversation about housing and how it impacts on caring capacity. For if our home doesn't meet our needs, we're assumed to exercise our market choices and to simply move elsewhere to a house that does. These ideas are a product of Western liberal philosophies of care, which we're going to keep touching on this morning. We really do need to move beyond this understanding. We need to think about and recognise housing as an infrastructure that's active in shaping how we all care. 
That means unpacking the work of housing markets, housing policy and design, and recognising them as infrastructures that are active in shaping the work of care. So what is an infrastructure in this context? Well, infrastructures are socio-technical tools or systems that help us to do things. They provide a platform and a structure for the reproduction of everyday life. Another way of thinking about infrastructures conceptually is as dynamic patterns that underpin social organisation. They're tools and systems that help us to do things. And in doing that, they give shape to what it is that we do and how we do it. And so in her work on um, information systems, Susan Starr really emphasises that productive work, that infrastructures make certain practices possible and they make them possible in particular ways. When we talk about an infrastructure of care then, what we're doing is bringing attention to the infrastructures that pattern the organisation of care within society, that help us to accomplish the everyday practices and routines through which we care for ourselves and for others. And in their work on medical care, Dan Holt and Langstrup describe care infrastructures as the more or less embedded tracks on which care may run, shaping and being shaped by actors along the way. And they trace the networks that run from pharmacies and GPs through to the home that support people with chronic illness to access and use medication on a daily basis, as well as when their routines change. And so our focus on housing and care is informed by feminist care ethics and by related efforts to identify the infrastructures of everyday life, or what Gilroy and Booth have termed the material and sociocultural support structures that enable the accomplishment of daily domestic routines. Identifying and making these infrastructures visible is a move to bring care to this very centre of how we think about our housing system. But what do we mean by care? <clears throat> care describes all the practices through which we survive and sustain our lives. Fisher and Tronto's definition from 1990 is now quite a classic one, um, and it informs the work that I do. They define care as a species activity that includes everything that we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment all of which we seek to interweave in a complex, life-sustaining web. Within the house's home, these practices include the labour of taking care of children as well as elder care. They include the work of housekeeping, of homemaking and self-care, including things like cooking, cleaning, eating, bathing and the work of maintaining our homes. Our homes are also anchors for care that takes place beyond the home, so our homes place us within communities and neighbourhoods within which we give and receive care, keeping an eye on neighbours' homes, caring for pets and children, supporting older neighbours to age in place. When we think about housing as a care infrastructure, what we're doing is bringing attention to how housing systems organise the possibilities of achieving these care practices from the household to the social scale. And this is really important because care is an essential practice that we cannot survive without. We are dependent on care from others from the time that we're born. And although our care needs do shift and change over the life course, they vary in nature and intensity from one person to the next, they change over time and place. The fact remains that we are always dependent on relations of care that extend beyond ourselves. And Selma Seven Hewson points out, people can only exist as individuals through and via these caring relationships with others. Care is really interesting. It's not just a practice, it's also an ethics. And as a set of ethics, it's, a, it's a, an ethics that entails attunement to the needs of others and oneself. David Conradson points out that care involves a movement towards another person in a way that has the potential to facilitate or promote their well-being, and that it may not involve physical caretaking tasks. So this is an ethics that can be part of interpersonal relationships as well as professional practice. It can also be practiced within organisations and as part of organisational culture. And so when we think about housing as a care infrastructure, we start by recognising how housing organises care, 
But we should also be motivated by these ethical possibilities that care offers us for transforming our housing infrastructures. Before we go too far though, a note of caution is always really important when we're thinking about care. To think about housing in this way is not to suggest that there's a natural or a simple connection between housing and care, and it doesn't assume that care is something that's being done well. So care can be performed minimally or badly. It can involve unpleasant feelings, and it can be done in ways that are violent or oppressive. And so to talk about housing as a care infrastructure is instead to recognise that domestic housing is the normative site of essential everyday care work and that our housing and our housing systems bring structure and shape to how we care for better or worse, both within households and at a social scale. And what that means is that questions of power and difference have to be central to any analysis of care. So we need to ask what sort of housing what sort of care housing makes possible, as well as who is excluded from care. Bringing an infrastructural analysis to questions of care requires that we pose three main questions. So the first one picks up from infrastructural thinking. We need to ask what it is that care infrastructures do. That means identifying the infrastructures that organise care and asking how. The second and related question is about the politics of infrastructures. So infrastructures both order and they create difference. They're really neutral. They have values and ideals that are built into them. They might be designed around an ideal or supposedly normal user. They might assume a particular body type or a way of thinking or a set of cultural practices. There might be a pay or an income barrier. And so the provocation here is to think about how our housing system organises how we care, how it organises who is able to give and receive care, and if there are care practices or ways of caring that our housing makes more difficult. The third question comes from care ethics, and this is a question about the transformative power of care and how we might reorganise our housing infrastructures so that they better and more equitably support the work of care. There's three main ways that housing infrastructurally organises care. These are through housing materialities and design, through housing markets and through housing policy. I'm going to talk about each of these in turn and I'm going to initially focus on how dominant housing infrastructures are shaped through liberal and neoliberal care ethics and how this has worked to materialise liberal visions of care within the city. After that, I want us to think about the possibility of change and how care offers us an ethic that can drive that transformation. So perhaps the most straightforward way that housing infrastructurally organises care is through the material space of the house itself. The size of our houses, the ways that they're designed individually and collectively, their internal layout, their material fabrication, their state of repair, all of these things inform how we live in our houses and in turn, they shape the ways that we give and receive care. And I've alluded to the fact that in liberal and neoliberal philosophy, care is a private domestic practice. This understanding of care has been powerful in shaping dominant cultural imaginaries of home and it takes its material form in the fabric of our cities and our housing systems from the ways that we have historically separated spaces of home and work through urban design through to the ways that we've built our homes as private and self-contained spaces with care facilities like kitchens and laundries that are replicated across every single home. As an infrastructure of care, these design practices have had some really important outcomes. One of these is creating and reinforcing care as a private household practice. It's difficult to organise care collectively across privatised housing. And so we each become responsible for cleaning and maintaining our own homes. And even practices that could be simple, like sharing care of children or food preparation, become much more complex logistical exercises. We can think about this as being an embedded track of housing infrastructure that reinforces care as a household scale activity. In conjunction with the gendering of care, these design practices place larger demands on women's time and they're the material foundation of the gendered privatism of care. Housing also shapes access to care in more individualised ways. 
So our housing system is largely organised around a normative body and it works to limit those who do not share this bodily form. So participants in Imri's now classic paper from 2006 set out how their use of a wheelchair makes it impossible to use their kitchen or to get around their bed to make it or to go into the bathroom and close the door. Their care practices and their ability to care in culturally appropriate ways are stymied by normative housing design, an infrastructure that demands workarounds and adaptations, but that also drives trauma and distress and a breakdown in care. But our housing doesn't have to be this way. Different ways of designing housing can become an infrastructure for different ways of doing care. My, my colleague Louise Crabtree points to Pinacarry in Fremantle, Western Australia, a co-housing community that was developed in collaboration with the state housing provider, and it combines public rental and private ownership. In addition to those mixed tenures that share the site, it features shared food gardens and a freestanding common house at the centre of the site with a kitchen, dining area and bathroom, meeting rooms, offices, a lounge room and guest room. Louise describes how the common house has become the focal point for much wider community activity with children's play spaces, meeting rooms and space for the broader community. There's informal childcare on site most days with children from the local neighbourhood casually observed by residents. Dolores Hayden's work gives some examples of housing that has or might have supported more communal forms of childcare and domestic work. So at the scale of a town, she talks about Kayserville, an industrial town that supported women's work during World War II through on-site childcare, cooked food services and public transport. So children could be dropped off close to work and cared for during the day, and women could collect dinner on the way home, which supported their capacity to work and manage their gendered responsibilities. Other examples include apartments built by Nina West Homes in London in the 1970s. So the image on the right of the slide is from a building that was designed for single parents. You can see in the top left of that image um, how there's a corridor between apartments that's set up as a children's play space. Kitchens in each apartment abut the playroom with windows overlooking the space to allow children to play together and for their parents to keep an easy eye on them while they share care collectively while managing other tasks. Other designs include on-site childcare, which is a way for single parents to manage childcare while working close to home. The image on the left of the slide reimagines suburban living with privatised blocks turned inside out and social amenities added to the core, a little bit like the Pinacarry model. In this case, there's a community daycare, veggie garden, picnic tables, a playground, grocery depot that's connected to a larger neighbourhood food co-op. There's also a car share. There's some resonances with David Holgram's imagined Aussie Street for 2020 Australia in his book Retro Suburbia. Both of these suggest not just new material care infrastructures, but new governing infrastructures that organise property around permeable and open borders they're designed to support shared care, collaboration and openness rather than only privatised care. We also have the tools for more inclusive housing. So universal design is in a really established framework for rethinking how we design and build housing to ensure that it meets the needs of diverse users across the life course. But while we know the benefits, there continue to be barriers to widespread uptake. So the next two ways that housing infrastructurally organises care is through housing markets and governance. And I want to think about how these work together in the Australian housing system, which is a liberal welfare state with a market-based housing system. Now, the thing about housing markets and policy in Australia is that they don't explicitly address care to any great degree. Although home is understood as being a key place where care takes place, the assumption that care is a private responsibility and that home is a private space sees the practices of care moved almost entirely out of the scope of housing policy. This reflects liberal care philosophies that see care as a private concern and a private responsibility. 
And this privatism of care has been turbocharged in recent decades through the growing sway of neoliberal thinking. Neoliberal philosophies put paid work and private markets at the centre of thinking about care. So care itself is seen as a good that can be bought and sold and people are understood to mostly and most properly meet their needs through the market, which is seen as a neutral device for distributing goods. And so in this framework, the fulfilment of our caring needs become the private concern of rational, autonomous actors who exercise their freedom through their market choices. And increasingly, housing is seen as being one of those choices. As a consequence, when we look closely at housing policy, we see that it's much more instrumentally focused around things like property rights, with focus played, placed on how we um, access housing. There's only very limited attention to how housing might support more everyday domestic needs, including care. And this is because it is assumed that individuals will buy and invest in housing that best meets their needs, and that when their needs change, they'll exercise their choice through the market. In this system, if we're not able to meet our needs, including our needs for housing, then we're seen as being personally responsible, as having somehow failed. Maybe we had too much avocado on toast. Maybe we just didn't get a good enough job and maybe we should try harder to do that. This is a really powerful move because it shifts responsibility for meeting care needs away from the housing system and away from the state. And it makes the impact of structural advantage and injustice on caring relations invisible. And these ideas underpin a growing split in how housing is valued. We're seeing a growing move from housing being valued mostly as a dwelling or a place that we live in and practice care to a focus on housing as an investment, an asset that, sure, it can be lived in, but it can also be traded to meet care needs. And we're seeing this globally in the, in the growth of asset-based welfare. Now, it's true that these investment values are one way that housing acts as a care infrastructure. The infrastructures that sustain this include federal policies like capital gains tax discounts, negative gearing benefits, aged pension assets benefits, things that work to make home ownership and housing investment a good financial decision for those who can access it. We can also look at state rental legislation that prioritises the right of housing investors to buy and sell housing when the time is right over the right of tenants to make a home and have a secure home. This has produced housing as a profoundly unequal care infrastructure because these values are only accessible to houses, households that can afford to buy and invest in housing. But we are not all equal in the face of the market. We know that housing costs create social difference in access to care through shaping the capacity that people have to afford to live in different places or to be housed at all. Aging outside of home ownership is a rough ride and single older women are the fastest growing group of homeless people in this country. Growing numbers of renters find themselves unable to plan for the future due to the tenure insecurity that's foundational to how the sector works. And renting is a key predictor of housing standard and health. As we're exploring in our work that focuses on the shadow care infrastructures that sustain the lives of people living in poverty in Australian cities, even severely inadequate housing is a care infrastructure. This housing shapes care in particular ways with consequences for how people are able to meet their needs, including driving new health needs or the need for different external supports. And so it's a reminder that all housing is a care infrastructure, but that the care that housing infrastructurally supports is not always adequate and can be vastly unjust. These are the hallmarks of a commodified care infrastructure where the rights of investors are greater than those for whom housing is a home. But it doesn't have to be that way. We need to change the conversation around housing. A housing system that cares is one that recognises the universal need for care and that works to ensure that all households are able to meet care needs adequately, regardless of income or tenure or any other marker of difference. It's the dwelling values rather than the investment values that we need to put at the centre of our housing system. The dwelling values are those things that living in a house gives you access to or lets you do. 
Housing gives us a place to live and ideally to be safe. It's a place in which we meet our everyday needs, including to rest, keep clean and eat. These are the most important values of housing because they're the values that most universally underpin the capacity of people to care. And Saskia Sassen in her opening keynote yesterday expressed real pessimism about the potential to shift our housing system in this way. And I share that feeling, but at the same time in more optimistic moments, I look to the housing movements around the world that are fighting to do just that. One example is the movement in Berlin that's seen a public vote in favour of buying back hundreds of thousands of rental apartments into public hands. We see the benefits of public housing across the world. In Australia, low-income households who live in public housing typically experience better outcomes than those in the private rental sector. Income index rents and the relative security of tenancies are the infrastructures that bring a better capacity to meet care needs and can bring a better sense of future security of care that's much more on par with ownership than it is with private renting. In social democratic welfare states like Scandinavia, there's little commodification of housing and housing is understood more so as a social infrastructure and in turn housing outcomes are more equal across the system. We can also pursue change in the meantime. We can start by changing how we talk about housing publicly. We can ask what it would mean to put care and home at the centre of the private rental system and what it would mean for a landlord or rental legislation to care. Staff in the public and not-for-profit social housing sectors are an important part of the care infrastructure in these sectors, ensuring that housing is a place to care and a space of care for tenants. And we can think back to Sue's powerful story to see the importance of housing governance that is sensitive to the particular needs of households. That's something I've seen practice much more strongly in the not-for-profit sector, but it doesn't have to be constrained to this space. There are small moves. These are small moves that are about refitting housing as an equitable care infrastructure. Policy changes are also important. So in Australia, as Hal Pawson pointed out yesterday, we could redirect over $100 billion in tax concessions that homeowners receive each year into programs that better support those who are left out. We could put limits on who can buy housing and how many houses people can buy. In the rental sector, Victoria has led the way in ending no cause evictions and recognising the place of pets within the caring responsibilities of households. These are small steps, but an important start. We can look east to New Zealand's healthy home standards for an effort to more clearly quantify and legislate housing quality. The evidence base around the care and social values of more collective ways of organising property are also growing. And our international review of cooperative housing describes a sector where cooperative governance frameworks are connected with enhanced social capital, better housing quality and stability, increased health and well-being, and skills acquisition that's connected with improved employment opportunities. And we're currently working with rental housing co-op providers and residents across Australia to better understand the social values and outcomes of this form of housing in our social housing sector. To briefly finish, you know, I think things can start to feel really bleak when we start to unpack our housing system and the ways that it operates as a care infrastructure today. But this is not the power of care. The reason I've turned to care in my work is for its offer of hope and change. Thinking with care, we see the values and the ideas that sit underneath many quite diverse and disparate housing practices and policies, and we can start to open up a more unified pathway to valuing housing differently. Care is an ethic that calls us to transform our worlds. It challenges us to see the ways that we are connected to and dependent on one another. And it calls us to not just maintain and continue our worlds, but also to collectively repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. To care is to reach out to another. It's to see the needs that other people have and that underpin their survival and flourishing. I think this is a really powerful guiding ethic to bring into our housing system. It challenges us as professionals to recognise the ways that housing is implicated in the capacity of every person to care. And it challenges us to work through research, through housing design and through housing policy 
to create a world and a housing system that cares and that all people can live in as well as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma, for that really brilliant opening lecture. Um, I'm really hoping that there'll be many uh, questions from the audience. There's a lot to think about here and some really important suggestions for how we move forwards. Uh, now I, what I'd like to do is invite um, Sina to make a response and also to speak from her position. Um, now, Sina is a mental health and disability advocate founder and facilitator of the LGBTIQA+, transgender, non-binary, intersex, gender diverse and inclusive Melbourne Homeless Women's Peer Support Group, which provides peer support to homeless women and those at risk of homelessness or in unsafe or unstable housing, with an emphasis on providing one-to-one -one peer support. Sina is a long-time advocate for systemic change in housing and homelessness system. So we're going to hear very much from her lived experience here. Sina, welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Sina. Thank you for having me to speak here today. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation their traditional custodians and elders past, present and emerging and extend my respects to any Indigenous peoples here today. I acknowledge sovereignty was never ceded and that homelessness didn't exist in this country before ongoing colonisation began. I also want to acknowledge the many resilient and hardworking homeless women, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, who have supported each other and advocated and fought for change for homeless peoples and for victim survivors and children and young peoples and gender diverse peoples escaping family violence. I also want to acknowledge and remember all of those who have died from homelessness, unsafe housing and family violence. I grew up in both Melbourne and regional Victoria. My family are from Country Vic. I founded and volunteer facilitating Melbourne Homeless Women's Peer Support Group. I started this group before the Black Summer bushfires and I support homeless women and gender diverse peoples with disabilities, chronic illness or mental illness, both regionally and in Melbourne. I study social work whilst working casual in research and family violence. I have trained in trauma informed practice and intentional peer support and have been long term homeless myself. Today, I reflect on how the current system does or doesn't provide access to care for homeless peoples and people living in unsafe or unstable housing or escaping family violence. I ask what does it mean for our housing system to become more caring, supportive and inclusive? Some parts of my speech are, tra are traumatic, so please step out of the room if needed and reach out for support. I would like to see the government implement more 80-20 safer housing models with 80% homeowner residents and 20% low income housing tenants like Nightingale Housing and the Summer Foundation models, which, are both, which have both worked on increasing resident and community connections in their buildings. Nightingale focuses on prioritising disabled peoples who are key community contributors. Safety and quality security modifications are important to tenants who are traumatised coming from homelessness into housings so that they do not vacate the housing because they are in danger or having conflict with ab abusive neighbours to prevent reoccurring cycles of homelessness. Cooperative housings are another great example of building community friendships and teamwork within housings. As everyone contributes to the work that they do to work towards running the housings together collaboratively. Common, Common Equity Housing Limit, Limited at the peak organisation for all housing cooperatives in Victoria. Warakan are a sustainability housing community in Gippsland. They live off the land and teach other people in the wider communities how to build their own tiny homes and earth dome houses. I recommend you see their film on their website. Kids Undercover build tiny homes for homeless young people escaping family violence. I hope to see in housings for the future to have more inclusive resident connections and community building, more community gardens, peer support programs for mental health, community connections programs and further investment in accessible national rental affordability scheme NRAS low income private rental properties and development of an accessible NRAS vacancy database. 
Many women I know have applied for hundreds and some women, including myself, for thousands of private rentals, but get discriminated against for and continuously rejected by agencies and landlords due to discrimination. There needs to be legislative changes and quotas developed to change the disability, racial, young people's, ageism, pet and low income discrimination in the private rental market and from landlords and address affordability and disability targeted abuse and other forms of discrimination in reforming the Tenancy Act. If the government could be our rental guarantors, create more head leasing programs and provide incentives to landlords to house us, and longer term leases, this would also help ease discrimination and continuously moving. Our government has no practical roadmap or plan to get young people, young disabled peoples out of institutions and nursing homes. And 99% of all supported independent living NDIS providers in Victoria only provide group homes and refuse to provide self-contained housing, even to severely immunocompromised and medically ill tenants. One of the main goals of NDIS was to help people get out of institutions and into living in the community. You need to have 24-7 support needs to get a specialist disability accommodation, and only 6% of people in the NDIS will get SDA. I think this is unfair because way more than 6% of people in the NDIS who are homeless and without stable housing suitable for their disabilities need SDA. This is in Victoria where 99% of private rentals and not disability accessible and trying to find an accessible rental is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. I have 15 major disability modification housing needs and no, no type of housing provider except for SCA will allow the modifications that I need. Many disabled people who are homeless and severely disabled are falling through the gaps in this system, also falling through the gaps with the Forgotten Australians organisations who also can't find people stable housing. NDIS policy states they won't fund home modifications if you're renting in low income housing. This policy is resulting in mainstream housing providers discriminating against and refusing to house disabled peoples who need multiple and major disability modifications and refusing to fund modifications for existing tenants and this is also happening not just in social and community housing, but also in public housing. People not having the modifications they need results in low quality of life and for many repeated falls, further permanent injuries, more chronic pain, and for some brain injuries from falls. For many, the lack of access means the housing is so unsafe and unsurvivable for their needs that this forces them to vacate into homelessness. Reforms advocated for by the Office of the Public Advocate are urgently needed for disabled people living in institutions who are too scared to go outside of their rooms due to all types of abuse. Both the NDIS and our government have also have no practical or accessible emergency plan for the bushfires, cyclones and floods response and the long-term homelessness created from these. And homeless peoples with disabilities or chronic illness who are at high risk of dying during these times of emergencies get left behind as they're too unwell to engage with the system. Older women are the fastest growing group of homeless peoples in Australia and the service system is failing them. Many are scared of ending up institutionalised so do everything they can to avoid the system entirely, which is why peer support groups are so important to not judge women and not pose any perceived threat of having the CAT team or police called to section them. There are major issues in the older people's housing systems and my aged care system, institutionalised abuse and neglect, negative and depressing social environments. Many older women don't want to go into retirement villages and nursing homes just because they can't find any other accessible housing. There needs to be stronger investment in more accessible, safe and long-term housing in the community as we have an ageing population. The new government policy to fast track people from hotels and motels into public, social and community housing is also leaving homeless peoples in the, in the NDIS and other institutionalised systems behind and also leaves behind people with complex needs or severe immune compromise who can't live in hotel system due to major barriers. With services, there is a low of dumping people in the too hard basket and continuous referring on for people with complex needs and people retelling their stories over and over again 
is re-traumatising and makes people want to give up, pushing them to become suicidal. Many homeless women I know have been forced to return to dangerous housing and abusive relationships because there is nowhere else less dangerous to go that is safe and refuges and crisis accommodations are full. And some I know have become pregnant while sleeping rough or escaped into homelessness fleeing family violence after becoming pregnant. Many women are also targeted for sexual violence and gang violence whilst being homeless. Many women can't cope from the torture of ongoing sleep deprivation and the impacts of sleeping rough on their health and don't want to be in unsafe crisis accommodations. Many women can't use their NDIS funding due to not having safe housing or staying in uninhabitable and highly dangerous housings where there are continuous police call-outs, ongoing violence, murders, sexual assaults, break-ins, drug dealing, stabbings and gang violence. Even police believe certain housing should be shut down due to being so poorly managed. The quality and responsiveness of housing management often determines if the housing succeeds or fails. How do they manage safety issues and respond to and prevent violence and abuse? What are they doing for COVID safety and outbreak prevention and response to outbreaks? How do they address social isolation and improve community, neighbourhood and resident connections and friendships? How do they make their housing safe for children and young people and visitors? How do they respond to drug dealings and crimes? Do they invest in rectification works and ventilation to stop toxic mould poisonings? How pro housing providers should be mandated to intervene in safety issues and providers who are failing should be held accountable. There needs to be consequences. Some of the worst of providers are highly abusive to their own staff, which compounds opportunities for reform. As many staff I know who quit working at these organisations are terrified of retribution from speaking out. Housing cannot be inclusive or focus on safety and fostering any sense of community and social connections unless it is safe. You're welcome to contact me by email, homelesswomenmelbourne at gmail.com. I had asked some resources I made to be uploaded online today, which includes a finding housing guide and NDIS appeals and NDIS housing resource and a long list of reforms I have been advocating for. Many people in unsafe housings are too scared to complain or speak out in fear of retribution and fear of losing their housing. We need urgent establishment of an independent watchdog who is fully independent from the housing homelessness system, workforce and government, who can accept and investigate anonymous complaints from residents, staff and homeless peoples and who are given a legal jurisdiction to intervene immediately in complaints where people's health and safety is at risk. A watchdog could also work to hold housing providers, organisations, head tenants and landlords accountable in all types of housings who are not managing their housings in safe ways. Those I have lost in my life to homelessness and dangerous housing and family violence are every reason why I do my advocacy and peer work. Housing needs to come first. Safety is the most important thing for trauma recovery. And no one escaping violence in their housing should have to choose between violence on the streets and violence in their homes because that is not a choice. Exclusion from private rental and how insanely difficult it is to get any type of NDIS housing is forcing many women into illegal arrangements and exploitation, abuse, slavery, violence and unsafe housing. A lot of my peer support work as a result of this, the way the system is, is crisis response, crisis resolution, mental health emergency support, supporting people to stay safe from violence and supporting and holding hope that one day they will get stable housing and not have to not give up on ever finding stable housing. More lived experience advocacy, housing advocacy and peer support is hugely needed and for homeless peoples to be given stable housing so we can contribute more to being employed in reform work and being included in working in partnership on the rollout and implementation of reforms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sina, for offering this account of the gaps and blind spots in our housing infrastructures of care and offering up some ideas about what we might do to make a positive change um, if, if, if only we could kind of gather the will and um, governmental support. Now what I'd like to do is introduce Claire Stacey, who's the Manager of Homes Victoria, 
with the Victorian state government. Claire has worked in public public policy, advocacy, research and community development for over a decade across the non-profit, government and public sectors. She's currently the manager of social housing reform at Homes Victoria. And prior to this, this, she was a policy and advocacy manager at Social Ventures Australia. Um, Claire's going to kind of offer a, a statement and response and a position statement um, for about five minutes. Welcome, Claire. Thank you. Um, morning, everyone. Well, it's almost afternoon. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're all joining this session uh, from today and acknowledge uh, elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal leaders in Victoria who are driving change in housing outcomes for Aboriginal people uh, in Victoria, particularly through mechanisms like the Victorian Aboriginal Housing and Homelessness Framework. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, and thank Sina for the stories that were shared about the deep and significant hardship that people experiencing homelessness and housing stress in Victoria face um, and the significant challenges that people uh, encounter in accessing safe, appropriate and affordable housing. Um, I work in the Social Housing Reform Unit at Homes Victoria, uh, which was, and Homes Victoria was established um, in 2020 to support the delivery of the big housing build. Um, I want to quickly pick up on some of the points made by our CEO, Ben Rimmer, in his keynote yesterday. Um, ben uh, made the comment or observation that social and affordable housing is essential infrastructure that supports the functioning of our society, economy and our resilience to major events. Um, Uh, ben also described that as Homes Victoria works with our sector partners to develop a pathway uh, for the future of the social and affordable housing system, that some of our key considerations include uh, that housing alone does not necessarily lead to good outcomes and that wraparound services and better integrated services are critically important, uh, that dwellings need to be accessible, well-designed and well-located, and that uh, importantly, lived experience perspectives need to be embedded in the design, delivery and evaluation of housing and services. So I'm going to try and quickly talk about three components of Victoria's social housing system and more specifically Victoria's public housing system uh, that align to the principle of care or care ethics. This is not conclusive, but hopefully a quick deep dive into three elements of the system that demonstrate care. So the first one is the social landlord framework. This was adopted by the Director of Housing in 2019. Uh, and it's really a response to the transition uh, of public housing that we've seen over the past few decades. We know that public housing was originally designed as a supply response to address shortages for low income working people. But that today, the uh, typical public housing resident uh, it is, has changed considerably and we now know that uh, public housing is meeting the needs of some of the most uh, uh, people in, in our community who are experiencing the most disadvantage. So people who with a history of homelessness, people living with mental illness, uh, people experiencing alcohol and drug addiction and victim survivors of family violence. Um, public housing residents uh, simultaneously use many other health and community services. So public housing hasn't adequately uh, responded and transitioned to these challenges as it's been um, up until recently a basic housing only model with poor links to support. So the social landlord framework um, is one of several initiatives that aims to address this and it has three components. The first is shelter, uh, so that's the core uh, property and tenancy management that has existed in public, the public housing system. The second is place, uh, that uh, refers to place-based responses to engaging the community and residents and local solutions. And the third is care, um, and that's about supporting people who live in public housing uh, to um, 
have better connections with health and community services and also leverage other community supports so that people can uh, live a life that they value. Um, the second initiative I'm going to touch on is um, some housing initiatives that are emerging from the Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system. Uh, the Royal Commission uh, has a broad set of sweeping reforms and recommendations for Victoria's mental health system, but there is a small component that relates to housing. And I thought in light of Emma's discussion, interesting to um, share how the Royal Commission observed the relationship between housing and mental health. Uh, they described the provision of stable housing as core and indispensable element of a comprehensive mental health and wellbeing system and that an effective housing and homelessness system leading to stable housing goes hand in hand with access to high quality mental health uh, treatment, care and support. So noting that there is a significant shortage of available social housing uh, for all, uh, all people uh, in need, but particularly for people experienced living with mental illness, the recommendation was for um, Homes Victoria and as part of the Big Housing Bill to deliver 2,000 dwellings uh, that are prioritised for people living with mental illness who require ongoing intensive treatment, care and support. And these dwellings are, um, are to be prioritised for adults uh, who um, really require intensive ongoing uh, treatment. Um, these dwellings are to be delivered in a range of housing configurations, so standalone units, self-contained wow. units, um, and possibly clustered independence un units on a single site property. Um, they are... Uh, intended to be appropriately located and provide for the requirements of people living with mental illness, but really importantly are to be co-designed um, by Homes Victoria, um, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Division at the Department of Health, who is a key partner in delivering this work, and obviously people with lived experience of mental illness. Um, and the, the housing is designed to be delivered uh, with accompanying wellbeing supports that are integrated, multidisciplinary and individually tailored uh, mental health and wellbeing treatment um, care plans for individuals. And hopefully quickly I'll just touch on the third um, component which is about universal design principles which has been touched on a few times in the presentations. Um, universal design uh, places human diversity at the heart of the design process so that buildings and environments are designed to meet the needs of all users. So new homes that are constructed by Homes Victoria incorporate universal design principles in planning and design. Um, all of the new homes under the Big Housing Build will strive for a minimum as a silver rating from Livable Homes Australia. Um, with at least 5% of social housing to have a high level of physical accessibility. Um, so this means that uh, the housing may have drop-off areas, paths, lifts and car parking um, that is all accessible. Um, it may also include step-free entry, step-free showers, ground-level accessible toilets, structural reinforcements um, and transitional spaces to allow for ease of movement. In addition to universal design, which really speaks to uh, the rights of people with disability, Homes Victoria is also considering and as building on existing practice um, how design can be more inclusive of people with diverse needs. And I think we, we see that most commonly with victim survivors of family violence um, who require uh, specific modifications and safety modifications to their home. But... Um, we're also considering safety and inclusivity for, uh, for example, for children, um, for LGBTQI plus people um, and anyone whose experience of the current design of housing um, may not be cur currently accommodated. Um, that's hopefully a very quick run through of um, some of the key um, elements of the work um, of Homes Victoria. Um, and I'll pass back now to Elaine.
Thank you so much, Claire. It's really exciting to hear about these initiatives with Homes Victoria. So I'm going to introduce our next um, speaker today, Erica Martino, who's a research fellow in healthy housing and a PhD candidate as part of the Healthy Housing CRE, or Centre for um, Health Policy at the, Uni at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne, where she's engaged in leveraging lived experience research. She has over 20 years of professional activity in the built environment sector as a designer, as an urban planner, and um, as a GIS officer in both the private and public sectors. Um, welcome, Erica. Uh, thanks, Helene. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge that this session is taking place on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to thank Emma for a wonderful presentation and for the insights offered by Sina and um, the other speakers. I think uh, Emma's infrastructure of care framework provides a compelling platform uh, in which to situate some of my own research, which examines the role of housing as an intervention for families, uh, victim survivors of family violence. Using this as a departure point, I think that we need to think about what an infrastructure of care means to different people. And I think as Sina aptly pointed out, for many women who need to leave a violent partner, care is about having adequate safety and support. Currently, the system is failing to provide this basic duty of care due to insufficient long-term housing, which means women can't gain or exit um, uh, emergency accommodation. In this landscape of scarcity, crisis accommodation is dangerous, there are barriers to accessing these systems and a lack of uh, wraparound support. Women are left going around in circles, they experience setbacks, discrimination, relapse and struggle to maintain housing. The whole process is dehumanising and it exacerbates the, um, women's feelings of invisibility and shame and is essentially a harm amplification process that re-traumatises and further marginalises women. And again and again, women return to perpetrators and risk their lives. Emma, I think your housing as an infrastructure of care is a critical lens in the context of this space as we need to better consider individual safety needs, how this intersects with sites that are unsafe and the structural barriers to safe housing provision. In applying your organisational framework of housing markets, materiality and governance, I would suggest that in the specialist family violence accommodation space, the governance needs to stem from policies and management practices that place women central to defining their own safety planning rather than just a, a risk management approach. Women who have come from coercive and violent relationships have had the capacity to make their own decisions removed and recovery must be grounded in reclaiming this basic right. For example, procedures need to recognise that this past trauma and support women's recovery through clear system navigation pathways and simplified processes, um, prioritising relationships, specific support plans and access to community partnerships. In terms of materiality, uh, I think that such safety planning needs to translate to women being able to make decisions around stable tenure, the qualities of the home, such as accessibility, whether there is a functioning kitchen or locks on windows, affordability and sensitivity, particularly in terms of um, violence to tensions between locational advantage of maintaining existing social connections and school access versus locational disadvantage around um, perpetrator proximity. Last and arguably the most important thing is we need to consider the market as the means of access to housing. Women are in a life and death situation. It is a public health crisis and they need housing quickly. We need short-term solutions such as purpose-built crisis accommodation and leveraging existing housing stock, such as um, vacant properties for meanwhile use, and we need long-term solutions such as much more public housing. If we had enough social housing and purpose-built crisis accommodation, women would not have to choose between leaving a perpetrator and homelessness. Support services could phase out their reliance on unsafe, unsupported and for-profit motel accommodations. Women would have the care they need to begin to heal from trauma and gain self-efficacy. 
I really hope that in this post-COVID world that we capitalise on some of the solidarity thinking that has come out of this crisis and that housing gains greater recognition and corresponding funding as a health and violence prevention intervention. If we can respond to the sudden crisis of a pandemic, I, I really think it is not unreasonable to expect that our governments respond to this slow crisis that is our dysfunctional housing market. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Now, this takes us to our final speaker for today, Associate Professor Nicole Carms, who's a founding director of the XYX Lab, uh, dedicated to gender and, and place uh, within art design and architecture at Monash University. Um, her research collates digital, experiential, political and material interventions to articulate the shared and conflicted struggles of women and girls. Her praxis repositions design as a strategic tool for challenging gender inequity. Uh, Nikki, welcome. Thanks, Alain. Thank you, everybody. Um, I would like to acknowledge that wherever we are, we are gathered on the land of the first and continuing custodians, and I offer my respect to their elders past and present and through them to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm joining this session today from the land of the Wadawurrung people. So the XYX Lab is currently um, funded by the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation to examine quality, affordable housing and landscaping for older women at risk of homelessness which is a post-occupancy study of housing types in suburban Melbourne. And this particular research area for the XYX Lab is led by PhD candidate Samantha Donnelly and is in collaboration um, with practitioner Sophie Dyering of SCORED Projects, and many of you would know their expertise in this field. Samantha Donnelly researches the spatial conditions of women's refuges and has worked on the design of transitional housing and currently leads this area for the XYX Lab. And Sophie is a passionate advocate and practitioner working in affordable housing and delivers social and affordable housing to those most in need. So I'm kind of thinking about this project with the questions for today's session in mind about how can design contribute to creating caring homes or how can architecture support people to give and receive care. And for the XYX Lab, the dominant mode that we are thinking about this is through aspects of co-design. So the research with the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, it produces a, a design guide to assist with improving housing for older women and will provide a foundation for developing fit for purpose accommodation for women over the age of 45. And it will be launched early next year. So do stay tuned for that piece of research. And I think the methodology of co-design and the various activities undertaken within this particular research pro um, project have really focused on foregrounding the lived experiences of women. So thinking more carefully about co-design and gender sensitive co-design, if you like, what we're kind of really thinking about here is quite simply, or um, not always simply, but it's really about recognising that women's um, needs and the needs of gender diverse people are different to men. And so what we kind of are faced with is that often um, with um, any kind of architectural urban thinking around cities and, and living, this kind of generalised or neutral approach, I mean, in this case to housing, is often sold as a one-size-fits-all approach that can kind of capture everyone's experience. And I'm really interested in this kind of face-off that exists between feminists and, and the kind of demands being made for gender policies and this kind of other thing around gender-neutral approaches which seem to be quite dominant um, in political culture. So um, I would suggest X Y X. I would suggest that women really lose out when we when we're thinking in this kind of neutral way, and also that this rejection of women centred policies, and we've heard about this this morning, um, is um, really important if we're going to be discussing infrastructures of care. So the X Y X Lab is interested in targeting um, and using gender sensitivity and intersectional approaches as a way to target this particular issue. And we think this is the best way that we can impact the very important and gendered experiences of women living in social housing um, or women who are at risk of homelessness. And this isn't a new concept. We know that um, uh, academics like Carolyn Witzman and, and many feminist practitioners would state that there's no progress in women's safety, which is of course at the core of um, women and, and housing. Um, there can be no kind of progress in that area unless we're really making sure that women are included in this process. 
And so in this way, the research that the XYX Lab is doing, the kind of co-design undertaken within the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation's project is really responding to women's experiences but also thinking about how people live through and respond to their experiences. And in this sense, um, uh, Professor of Communication Robin Boylan kind of talks about this idea of engaging with lived experience and how it leads to self-awareness that acknowledges the integrity of an individual life and how separate life experience can start to resemble or respond to a larger public um, kind of thematic and can create a space for interpretation and meaning making, which I think is relevant for the discussion we're having today. And so just with this in mind, I thought it would be useful to step through how Sam and Sophie have engaged with the women that they've been working with in the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, which has essentially involved interviewing residents and really thinking very carefully about their lived experience of the housing type in which they're in and whether or not that housing type is meeting their needs and how it is... Um, uh, it affects their quality of life. And what's interesting about this particular bit of research is that the residents were provided with digital cameras to photograph their homes and they were also given a kind of set of prompt cards to help them frame that kind of photographic response. And just kind of to lightly touch on some of the things that happened, um, I think that what we kind of started to see was there was a visibility given to the things that women valued in their housing so they were asked to photograph things that gave them a sense of dignity, that um, reflected the, their personality in their home, to think about what um, aspects of their home supported their independence, to think about what actually makes a place a home, to think about what gives them a sense of safety and security. And so these things gave kind of, um, as I say, visibility to some things that may have gone unnoticed if we hadn't kind of engaged in that kind of process of participation but also provided a way to think about a very nuanced and complex conversation that then Sam and Sophie had with each of the residents around the social and spatial and environmental relationships that they had to their home, whether it was a townhouse or a tiny house or a rooming house or an apartment um, or crisis accommodation. So um, I think one of the key things that came out of this particular, I mean, there were, there were several thematics, but one of the things that most interests me is this kind of reflection that the women had on security as a primary concern for their sense of safety and well-being. Um, and this did include things that we've talked about today, like children and pets and, and those kinds of extensions of what safety and security might mean. But also there were some really kind of interesting nuances about ideas of security and um, how to kind of think about windows and coverings and how to kind of think about looking in and looking out how to think about security at night time and, and, and security after dark, and just these kinds of um, ways that particular architectural gestures could feed into that kind of idea of choice and indeed a um, sense of home. So I'll, I'll finish there and I'm looking forward to the discussion that follows. Fascinating to hear about that research. And it, it, it appears to me across um, the speakers today, from Emma through Sina, Claire, Erica and Nicole, there's been a lot of emphasis on this focus on lived experience and how we learn from that in the stories that we're telling, um, in the ways we hope uh, this allows a better understanding of the patterning of care as Emma has described it. And also, ideally, I suppose, how from these stories and from this lived experience, we can have some kind of impact on policy frameworks, on modes of governance. I'm wondering whether we could start, we've got a number of questions coming through. Uh, I wonder whether we could start with how we get from witness testimony and stories all the way through to policy and shifting the will of our local and um, federal governments, local, state and federal. Um, any, anyone can kind of launch in on that. Oh, thanks, Alain. I guess I'll um, <laughs> might kick start. Um, and it would be great to hear Cla um, Claire's reflections on this as well. I think coming from inside of government, I think we're um, in a in quite a difficult position at the moment. Um, you know, we've got decades of investment in the investment values of housing and in underfunding 
public housing. So I really do think that part of what we need to do is to try and change this conversation around housing. We need to change the discourse. And I think that, you know, we need to take that to government, but it's something we also all need to do every single day. We saw what happened at the last federal election when um, the opposition tried to challenge some of these policies, capital gains, tax, negative gearing and so on. And it completely bombed out because um, people who have an investment in the system felt threatened by it. So I think that it's something that we need to start. You know, I say to people, talk, to, talk about housing as a care infrastructure when you're at a barbecue on the weekend. Talk about it um, in the lunchroom at work. Talk about it when you're writing policy. I think we need to try and shift the discourse. But I also think that we need to, um, to start with these sort of meanwhile, in the meantime, um, solutions. You know, we can't wait for the government necessarily to do stuff. And there's fantastic examples all over the world, all over Australia, of people trying to do stuff differently. Um, advocacy work that SIN is doing is superb. Um, the research we've heard about today is superb. You know, there's really interesting examples in Sydney and I know in Melbourne as well of buildings that are made available as crisis accommodation while they're waiting development approval. There's little things that we can do in councils that, that developers can be part of, that, that local government can be part of to create spaces for people to live um, in the meantime while we fight for a bigger set of changes. Absolutely. Claire, perhaps um, some words from Homes Victoria. Um, sure. Um, I think that, you know, for Homes Victoria, there's a recognition that engaging with lived experience is um, not something that has always happened um, to the highest standard within the housing system, but within government, there are existing practices, frameworks, um, policies that can be drawn on. And I think that when we consider lived experience and engagement in design of policy, that um, for, for people where that framework or that way of thinking may be unfamiliar, some of those existing frameworks and practices can provide really um, powerful tools and avenues to bring the voice of people into the room. So um, the challenge, I think, for Homes Victoria will be through um, the co-design of the 2000 mental health supported dwellings, um, and that will be a hopefully quite a powerful learning experience to work with quite established lived experience structures within the Department of Health. Thank you so much, Claire. I might I might might shift into some of our questions, which extends on this. You know, what do we do? Um, uh, we have a question from Stephanie Chu, who thanks the panelists, and you know, again draws our attention to the waves of housing insecurity and rental displacement that we're, we're experiencing. And you know, we can sort of try and shift the discourse. We can try and push back at sort of um, government. Uh, how how do we work? What do we do? What are the ways of sort of um, framing our infrastructures of care uh, from the point of view of the community in relation to councils as individuals um, seeking care. Um, you know, uh, I guess, you know, there's more questions. How do we do it? <laughs> I'm not sure. Was that question directed to me, um, Ellen? I, you know, I, I think we can we can all take this up, but maybe we can go back to Nikki, in fact, because I suppose in, in some senses we can shift the discourse, but we can actually see how design might make a positive um, impact. So perhaps Nikki wants to pick up on that. I, I might kind of talk across both of those questions because, I mean, I think it's an interesting uh, question. I like this idea um, that Emma's talking about, the kind of in the meantime. You know, a lot of the work that we're doing in the XYX X Lab is we, we know that the change is generations away. And, and I know that's not happy news, but it is, it's, it's kind of true. So what are the things that we're doing in the meantime? And I'm also thinking about Again, you know, not, not a happy conversation, but a lot of these conversations are internal. They're women sitting around talking to each other and we're all nodding our heads in agreement about this thing that we think is really important. So the ways that the XYX Lab has developed um, strategies to get into this kind of political space is to de-escalate, de-elevate the, the person that thinks they're an expert, whether they're an architect or a politician, and actually bring them into contact with the lived experience people. So that requires a very strategic and carefully designed process of not just co-design, but um, a, a, a way of kind of having a, a equal footing in, in a design process. 
And we often find that that's kind of the radicalisation of the people who are in power who are making decisions and that's where that can occur. So that process, I think, is the kind of in the meantime thing where you start to create create advocates um, and activists through that process. It's really hard to not change your mind in the face of these stories and the things that we're talking about today when it's kind of embodied in, in you know, everyone's together. So that's been our kind of strategy. Okay. Uh, let's also look to another question um, here. We've got Simon Joe, who's asking about uh, the role of on-site childcare facilities, um, which we've heard about from a, a couple of people today. Uh, how does this work? Are they always going to work? Who's subsidising them? Um, you know, the question of cost and who wants it and who doesn't. And again, this seems to be the challenge of how we shift our value systems and work on these problematics together. But uh, I'm happy if, um, you know, Erica or Emma would like to pick up on this one and or Sina. Um, Helene, I could probably talk a little bit about, about that idea of integrated childcare. Um, I recently, well, recently, a couple of years ago, I was in Canada and I saw a wonderful project in Vancouver um, that offered um, supported housing for women and as part of that they had on-site um, services for um, employment, um, for healthcare and for childcare services. And all of that happened above a public library. So the local government, the city of Vancouver was able to provide the land for that project. And because they were the landholder, um, they worked with a developer and were able to integrate their own existing um, community services as part of that development. And I think it's a fantastic model that that um, we could replicate here across many instances. Um, yeah, so that uh, I think it's a fantastic model. Thanks so much, Erica. So there's there's stuff that we can do about childcare and integrating this into housing for sure. And we I can think work one of the things, um, yeah. just to build on um, Erica's comment and to kind of respond to that question a bit more, I think it's really important that these things are authentic to the people who live in a community um, or to mm -hmm. the you know the town centre uh, where people are working. It needs to be a need and it needs to be something that people are invested in. Otherwise, you do end up with the sorts of exploitative or um, you know situations that that Simon referenced in the question or, you know, situations where you have a service that's massively underutilised. So it's about the sorts of, um, you know, co-design questions that Nikki's bringing into the conversation. It's about saying what's right for the people who live in this community, what are the things that they need? And, and the great thing about something like that on-site childcare is that, you know, in, in the example that I gave in um, that the Nina West homes, that was in a, a block of housing that was designed specifically for single mothers. And so some of those women were actually getting employment from working in that service and, and other children, other parents from the local area were bringing their children and paying to use that facility. So it's about something that needs to be integrated with the community and integrated and reflect the needs of people. Thanks so much, Emma. We also have a question from Sangeetha, um, specifically for Claire, in fact, asking about how social value and care is being monitored and evaluated within the build, Big Build project and what kinds of data are being collected and what indicators might be relevant to assess the effectiveness of the Big Build from a social value perspective. Uh, so this is a big question for Claire. Um, yeah, and I might... Uh, so I can speak to a, a more recent development um, within public housing, which is the resident uh, survey, uh, which collects insight and data from uh, pub current public housing residents. And that definitely shapes and informs um, housing policy and program development. The development of a more consolidated uh, social outcomes framework, which would still pretty much sit within the outcomes of the social housing system um, is in development. So I guess I'd be keen to put it back to the panel about what what are what would you see as the indicators that could really demonstrate some of the things we've been talking about. I also see we've got only two minutes left, so I'm not sure if there's just one line from each panel member. Uh, you know, if we run through everyone, one final statement, starting with Emma. Look, we need to be working towards diverse housing models with diverse um, you know, levels of affordability to suit the different groups. We need to put these um, values at the centre of the system to make sure that everyone has access to equitable housing. It's a big 
challenge, but it's also a simple question. So that's where I would start. Sina, have you got a one-liner to help us conclude? Um, just that I really feel that the reforms need to be co-produced with people with lived experience and that I think that local and state government and LGAs need to be working together more to change things like councils can, they do the permit approvals so they could have some influence on mandating new developments to provide a certain percent, percentage of their apartments to low income housing and there are so many em empty homes that the councils really need to intervene on this. Okay, Erica. Uh, yeah, I would echo Sina's uh, sentiment and say that we need to draw on um, expert by experience frameworks that, for example, the um, domestic violence Victoria has a fantastic model that I think could be um, adopted uh, definitely in terms of housing. And um, Nikki. I would suggest adherence to a best practice design guide that's been co-designed with people who have lived experience of these issues. So Claire, in a way, these are a few ideas, um, but thanks so much for the provocation. And I'm afraid we're gonna to have to draw it to a close. I'm already going over, I've been a terrible chair, but I wanna thank you all for this really fantastic discussion and wonderful um, papers and position statements. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank Helene. I want to thank uh, uh, Emma, Sina, Claire, Erica and Nicole for such an important conversation. It was great to hear about the initiatives, the research that's been underway. Um, I was really struck by Erica's words about the slow crisis that is Australia's dysfunctional housing market and the importance that it came through again and again and again of the lived experience of the likes of Sina. Uh, it's so important to have that at the centre of policy discussion and design and the like. So, so much to take away from that session. Now, we are about to open our discussion circles. We're expecting lots of great input from all of you, and you will have the opportunity to share your opinion and your insights. In a moment, you'll be heading back into the virtual lobby, and that's where you'll select from either of these rooms. There are three of them. One is housing and productivity, uh, the second is, have we been here before? Housing initiatives in Melbourne in the 1960s. And then thirdly, creating visions of affordable housing in a regional context. So they're the three uh, uh, discussion circles you have to choose from. So when you're in your discussion circle, if you want to come on screen to speak, please uh, raise your hand using the icon in the top right corner of your screen and, and the moderator will invite you to speak. And again, should you need any technical support, please search event support in the top chat inbox and our staff will be there to help. So once again, thank you for joining this panel discussion and conversation and we'll see you in the discussion circles.